This is Beyond Species, a podcast exploring issues around speciesism and the struggle to dismantle it. Steve and welcome to the episode. In this episode we hear from Camilla. Based in Argentina, Camilla explains why mainstream vegan advocacy doesn't work there. She speaks about the need for a new approach rooted in institutional education and tailored for the specific challenges of the region. Camilla is also learning about feminism and considers how this links to anti-speciesist activism. So do you want to start then by telling us um, how you got into activism? Um, yeah, I started about over a year ago, a bit over a year, a year ago. I had been following some accounts on Instagram and YouTube, mostly Ed, I guess, and Joey's videos. Yeah, the classic Ed and Joey uh, combination. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, any people who are getting into this and wanting to get active are more prone to watching um, because of all this rage and fire you got inside. And those videos kind of fit that, that feeling, mm. right? Mm. Yeah. So I started watching those videos and one day I was crawling down on Instagram and found a post about some meeting that was going to be held at my city. And it, it had the AV logo, so I decided to go. They went over this um, 30 excuses, you know, the, this short text oh, okay. mm -hmm. it, it, it has posted. Mm. And the next day they held a cube and mm -hmm. I went there. We were, I think, five people. Five people in the whole cube. In, yeah. yeah. So okay. we were two, two holding the, the computers and three outside mm -hmm. doing the outreach. Um, being a small CC, of course, not many people stopped because mm -hmm. it's not like hundreds of people walk by <laughs> if mm. you, you know, it's, th yeah. there are not many people in, this, in the streets. Mm -hmm. So I, I did that and a couple of weeks later, I found a group that was about to start doing boycott and another one that's called Animal Libre, it's like free mm -hmm. animal. Okay. Um, and they, they were doing both together because, again, small city, small group of vegans. Mm -hmm. We are all together in the in all the different organizations, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess we got most know by now because they started collaborating with Ed. Mm -hmm. Do you want to just explain, just for anyone who hasn't come across, what boycott is, like what it actually is? Um, yeah, boycott it focuses mainly in publicity and ads. So they had this kind of catchy sentences mm -hmm. in signs. So you glue them on different walls on the street. Okay. Um, it, it, it focuses mainly on that catchy phrases that might catch your attention. Mm -hmm. It has received some criticism because of some interpret these sentences or phrases as welfareist. Okay. So, yeah, it, but I don't know. It's you, you can see in any city mm -hmm. here by now. So it's quite quite common. So is is boycott like one person or is it a group? No, it is a group. I think it was founded 
by two people who were okay. into in, in this whole publicity advertising. Okay. So it's like, can you get like copies of the posters to just go and stick up in your town and things like that? Yeah, you can buy them, buy those posters from them, or mm -hmm. you can just get the, the file and print them yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they, okay. they offer both options. Yeah. I saw, I know you mentioned there that uh, Voicot did like a, I guess a collaborative with Earthling Ed. So I saw footage of them going up in London, I think, or at least somewhere in the UK. And, and it was slogans like meters murder. And it would say Voicott and Earthling Ed, but I don't under I didn't understand like what the link was with Ed. Is it because to me it looked it could look like a kind of cool um, poster for a club night, you know, like with some DJ names. I, I think that was uh, the the first idea mm. to use this kind of um, I don't know already set design that mm. is useful to, to promote yeah clubs and stuff like that and turn mm. it into catchy sentences about animals and veganism. I think that was kind of the idea. So it will get your attention because it could be about some band or cool stuff, mm. but it was about mm. animals and veganism. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so with this group, we started doing this kind of sticking posters and also this other organization, Animal Libre. It, it's kind of very particular to this region. It started in Chile mm -hmm. and it's now in several Latin American countries. And the thing is, it's quite more flexible because it considers different types of activism. Mm -hmm. For example, it's not just outreach, but you could have, you could host movie screenings or sell food or have cooking classes. Um, so you have a bit more room to decide how to do activism. Mm -hmm. um, and the interesting part of this organization is here in Argentina, it's promoting a bill project, you call it, for public institutions to have vegan food available. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So to get to get more vegan food options made. No, available. no, no. To, to no. have vegan food. Oh, only uh, vegan food. At least you have one option because here you you yeah. cannot have that option at all in okay. any place, yeah. mostly. Oh, so I see what you mean, right? Okay, so, yeah. Uh, to, to have the option to mm -hmm. get vegan food. Yeah. It's a good campaign. Yeah, and, and that's the thing. It's a bit, you have the option to get a bit more political with this organization. Mm -hmm. And you do not have it with other. With groups like AV, you mean? Yeah, you just yeah. have this outrage set. Mm. And at least that's the only thing I've seen with the mm -hmm. AV logo or under the, the AV name. I haven't seen any political movement or, or projects. No. No, it is j just really the same thing over and over and over. Yeah. which is street outreach and then workshops about street outreach yeah exactly. and then videos about street outreach <laughs> it, yeah, yeah basically everything is street outreach yeah, yeah um, totally. and and th that that's the thing well uh, i live in a small city so street activism or street outreach doesn't really make any sense because not many people walk by so mm -hmm with a reduced amount of people you can talk to and that then considering the even more reduced amount of people who could actually consider what you're talking them into <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah it's not the best mm -hmm. the best dynamic here so having the, the option to do other things and uh, I, I believe it's quite important to 
to get political about it. Mm -hmm. So this particular organization is quite interesting in that. Mm. And were there any successes that you had with Animal Libre? Um, not yet. Okay. Well, th this project is still waiting, I don't know, to, to get sanctioned mm -hmm. or something. Uh, with this whole COVID and stuff, it's not yeah. like they have given it much relevance to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of other things have taken over and it's people need to take some time out to think how do we continue our activism in this new situation. Yeah, we we are really, uh, at least I think we should feel forced to rethink our activism. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Mm. So no, no, not really. Um, uh, I... I feel like, for example, the cooking classes have been more effective mm -hmm. than outreach. I mean, it, it's the same that happens with activists. You are going to get more followers if you want to call it like that. If you mm. upload, I don't know, recipes than if you upload things about animal use or animal rights so mm -hmm. food is a great hook mm. and you can get the conversation started yeah i suppose with cooking classes what's really good about it is you're giving people the practical skills as well as kind of connecting with them socially so you're kind of breaking down that us versus them barrier and you're inviting people in to share, you know, something positive, which is food, uh, like good, healthy, fun food, you know? Yeah. And also you go a bit against this stereotype that veganism is like a cult. So mm. it, it's a bit showing that we are just normal people who care about animal use. And mm -hmm. that, that doesn't mean we hate people, we hate humans, which is also yeah. care about other animals. And mm -hmm. I, I guess for most people would not be ideal, but with the, the social reality that we have here, food is, mm -hmm. a, is a very important part of this activism because mm -hmm. you are not condemning people for not having any other option, but offering them another way to see it and another way to approach it. Mm. Well, how well is veganism doing in your area? Not good. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think the, mm, the main thing is we need to acknowledge that it's a very different reality here where mm -hmm. people are literally dying because they do not have food. So okay. we need to approach veganism as a whole social issue, not just for other animals. It's about Mm -hmm. a whole thing of injustice we we have a very different culture very rooted in speciesism and going against that it just it creates a barrier mm. so we need to acknowledge that culture and and the way speciesism kind of manifests itself in each society and in our society is it's everywhere and it's also a reason for social injustice mm -hmm. we really need to to consider how it impacts here mm -hmm. like i said we have like two main barriers i guess one would be 
poverty and the, the how hard it is for a lot of people to have food access mm -hmm. and then we have the the culture or the tradition if we think about the cultural part we have a whole mm. ritual it's not just about food but one of the main things is this ritual around let's call it barbecue it's called asado mm -hmm. so we have this whole ritual set around it where it's not just about this animal parts that you're grilling but it's a whole thing about mm -hmm. celebrating and being with your loved ones and being with your family and friends and you know the best thing that could happen here if you had to celebrate is holding the barbecue so i want to just go back a bit to the thing that you mentioned about poverty um and like the economic issues what are what is the economic situation in argentina that prevents people um from getting access to food well it's it's a quite big country and we're with very 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 different politics in each region so in the north yeah people are literally dying because they do not have food access they are dying from starvation mm. um so there's this there's a huge problem with food distribution and the truth is that a lot of people who do not have money to go buy food they hunt animals because that's the only way they can afford to eat okay um so uh, i think this forces us to think about food justice or we call it for sovereignty here mm -hmm. because if people are dying we cannot force them to think about something else mm -hmm. but first need to acknowledge that they need to have their basic needs fulfilled and and then we can start asking them to care about something else but also it's it's all interlinked because yeah as we know mm -hmm. animal agriculture takes away food from people mm -hmm. because that same i mean we produce an insane amount of soy for example mm. it's really about redistribution if if we had a different system mm -hmm. and a different you know, agriculture system i guess it, it could be different I think here the main problem is we are approaching veganism from quite an a classist uh, point of view, mm. and we cannot we cannot separate it from sort from social justice. So I guess then in a big city like Buenos Aires, there would still be the vegan trend um, because there's maybe a fair amount of people there with money but in a lot of smaller places and uh, rural areas there's people struggling just to uh, survive and some of these people will take to hunting and one of the big causes of this then is that there's agriculture but that's being used a lot of it is being used well a lot of it is animal agriculture is a lot of the the meat exported is that part of the problem or is it just there's so much poverty that people can't afford the basics or maybe it's a mix or something i think it's a mix but mm. yeah definitely the problem is there is no no minor redistribution so there we have a lot of poverty mm. i i well, I don't want to lie, but I think the the poverty line is about fifty percent of the population. It's mm, um, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And 
it's a huge difference. And mm. again, when people cannot even afford the, the basic things and depend on on the government giving out food, or mm -hmm. for example, now that we are on lockdown, mm. there are a lot of kids who depended on the food they would get at school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So so we we cannot really pretend for people to care about something else but their survival. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what kind of activism I mean before the lockdown because obviously I, I think most people are struggling to do whatever activism they were doing before the lockdown but I take it you moved on from so you moved on from AV um, and you did some stuff with Animal Libre and the Voicott posters. Was there anything else that you were working towards or working on outside of those? Um, no, I guess the last things we did with Animal Libre was we kind of we didn't disrupt, but we did some outreach at a festival, a salami pork festival. It, it was, it, it's terrible to think about it, but it's a festival. Uh -huh. And we did some outreach there. Oh, okay. Because I live in a city that's called a salami city, I guess you would call it. Okay. And every, every year they held, they, they hold this festival to get some kind of record of the longest salami ever i don't know it's ridiculous <laughs> it's outrageous yeah. and all of the things together but that the last thing we did or i did was that kind of outreach and then i started feeling like it wasn't enough mm. um and this kind of single issue veganism started i don't know I, I didn't feel comfortable with it to be mm. honest and in parallel i started stu uh, studying about feminism and doing a specialization on you know critical gender studies mm -hmm. so that kind of opened a door to the theory and ideology behind social movements and and then uh, I started to feel like I was missing the political dimension of it, and I just took a, a step back from mm -hmm. from activism. And I guess that's where I'm still at, mm -hmm. trying to to study and understand how it all interlinks, and trying to also move away from this first world dynamics mm -hmm. that don't really adjust to the reality we live in in this region. Mm. So I, I attended a congress last year held here in Argentina about animal rights and we discussed a lot of these things and how to how to start approaching animal rights and animal liberation and speciesism from more of an educational point of view, how to really get inside the system and change it from the inside. Mm. Because the truth is wanting to kind of get to people one by one, mm. we, we cannot keep up with the rates that the system produces meat eaters. Yeah, absolutely. Or, or we, we just cannot. That's impossible. That's not feasible. Mm. So we need to, to start thinking politically. And that's where I'm at, trying to find out how speciesism interlinks with the social injustices that we see here, how mm -hmm. to make it particular for this region, uh, for, for my country, 
mm-hmm. and then find a way to to start getting an, in, inside the politics of it and changing it. Mm. So I think that's a really important point that I have seen other people make recently. Um, and I think one was um, Cranky Vegan. I don't know if you've seen his YouTube videos. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So for anyone listening who doesn't know Cranky Vegan, definitely check out his. This isn't a plug, by the way, but while I'm at it, I might as well. Um, yeah, Cranky Vegan is good because he was involved. I mean, he's been involved in the animal liberation movement for years. He was uh, involved with the Shack campaign, and now he has this YouTube channel. And um, one of his recent episodes was about how often we do activism out of like a sense of desperation. And that's kind of, I think, like when you see, especially with the COVID-19 situation at the moment, a lot of the larger activist groups coming up with like ridiculous publicity stunts that like, I'm not sure they've taken the time to really think, okay, how is this going to make people think how is this is this really going to be effective and so much of our activism i think is um kind of based on the action okay i need to go out to this protest okay i need to go to this vigil i need to go do outreach because if i don't i'm not speaking up for the animals but if you're doing all of that stuff without actually having sat down and thought up an actual strategy uh, and then from that strategy there's these different tactics that you can do then you're just doing actions that could be a complete waste of time. And so we need to take a step back and just like what you're saying is to look at what can I do in my local area uh, that's really going to work. And um, I think public education is definitely a huge part of it, but we've got to bear in mind that Uh, the school system, the university system, mass media, these are all every day educating the public in one way or another in a speciesist way. So we have to get, like you say, get in there and do something on a bigger scale, I think. It doesn't have to necessarily be a bigger scale, but it needs to be not um, speaking to random strangers in the street. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with that. Um, there's a there's a great um, a PhD thesis that I read um, for my woman from from Buenos Aires, mm-hmm. and it, it she studied there how all these public institutions reproduce this speciesist way to to see life in general Mm. and it was it was very 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 interesting because for example she she analyzed their lots of kids songs songs that you would sing to children and how you you know you I would use, usually do not think about it, but you hear those songs from a very early age, and it says, mm-hmm. "So the cow gives you milk, and it's mm-hmm. great, and she loves it." In mm-hmm. you know, very summarized, right? But we we have that education from a very 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 early age and how can we fight that Mm. going one by one trying to talk to them about animal use Mm. it's just not possible so we need to to rethink education and rethink how yeah how, how we teach young people and and next generations about how everything everything interlinks and how Mm. animal use and any other form of oppression you know racial oppression or class or gender everything is interlinked 
Mm -hmm. um, and the only thing to do that is by getting political and changing the educational system. Mm. And yeah, this is where when people say that veganism isn't political, it's just ridiculous because taking something like um, the school system, for example, I mean, that's highly political because you can be guaranteed that the meat industry will be influencing it somehow in probably numerous different ways. Even things just like, well, they're providing the food to the school canteens for starters. Yeah. They'll be sponsoring certain projects um, within the schools. They might even be helping to pay for buildings and all this kind of stuff. So, so at my work, um, I work in the healthcare sector and um, the meat industry goes to like government funded, like open days all about healthcare, and they take their pamphlets along that tell you all the, the health benefits of eating meat, uh, you know, and that's that's alongside the government. So the meat industry is everywhere in all these institutions. They've got their fingers in. So I'm more surprised that we spend so little time focusing on institutions. Definitely. Here we, all, we also have this problem that it is very hard to find health professionals that know anything at all about veganism and and plant-based nutrition mm -hmm. it is not accepted mm. so how if if somebody hears about it and is curious and wants to change but they do not have a support system because the dairy industry and the meat industry i mean it, it's all it's all completely rigged right mm -hmm. they, yeah. they are everywhere and if here for example the milk industry or dairy industry finances a lot of workshops so mm. They, they are directly feeding us literally and figuratively mm. that they are the best way you can thrive and that's the mm -hmm. best way to feed your newly born and it's it's everywhere so if if we separate veganism from the political aspect of it we are just we we cannot ever catch up we cannot ever get mm -hmm. there mm. because all you'll have then if you separate it from the politics is really just um a diet trend exactly i did a, like a, an experiment the other day where i just typed vegan into youtube <laughs> and like just type vegan into instagram and see what comes up and i mean it's not good <laughs> viewing <laughs> no 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 it's um i mean i think by now we should start thinking that anti-speciesism or animal rights mm. nowadays they are different from veganism it's not how it started mm -hmm. but it's the way they are now kind of redirecting the meaning of the word vegan um mm. it's all it mm. is almost a synonym for plant-based yeah and maybe you can sometime hear something about animals but in general it's just food mm. and being fit and yeah it has all this mm. yeah the fitness thing has been a really big element of it and i find it quite frustrating because we can talk about the health benefits of plant-based food, but it should be about like kind of what we were speaking about earlier, about people being able to get access to healthy food that will keep them healthy and it should be affordable. It shouldn't be about, you know, counting your macros and how much muscle mass you gained um, and what kind of protein powder you're on and this kind of shit. 
you know, that's just more, that is like basically Western toxic diet culture. Yeah. And also that's, that's a huge thing because again, a lot of this information we get fed from mainstream vegan, you know, mm. called quotation marks, um, vegan activists. And that's a lot of the discourse that we've reproduced and it's just not adjusted to what happens here. How can we talk mm. about, you know, getting fit on a plant-based diet if we are not even talking about people not having what to, anything to eat at all? Mm -hmm. And also our whole food system is based on animals we do not know mm. any cereals at all but rice mm. so how can we pretend to to go about telling people they are going to be fit and healthy if they do not know what the options are mm. and we, we mm. have this this whole speech that we are repeating because we see online and we see it on videos because it might, I don't know, it might make sense when you are in Western Europe countries or in the US or in Australia, but it doesn't make any sense here because it doesn't adjust to our mm -hmm. social, economical, political situation mm -hmm. mm. and, and that's that's the problem here because we have this influencers that that mm. that repeat that same mm -hmm. yeah, and i guess when people first go vegan and like actually you said you got into activism about a year ago but were you vegan for long before that or uh, uh it was it was weird because i was don't want to use inappropriate words, but I was kind of a vegan in the closet for a long time. Mm -hmm. Again, because of the social aspect of it and being left out of a lot of the social, yeah, of a lot of meetings and mm. being judged a lot because there's this image of the that, that you are kind of on the high horse mm. because you are vegan and then your morals are better and then you believe you are better than everybody else mm. I, I i guess that's the thing when you see these famous vegans they do not help at all and they reproduce this idea that veganism is some kind of cult and very classist mm -hmm. um, so when you go vegan in a small town where you have a lot of contact with the rural world because i, I mm -hmm. know people who themselves have killed animals to then eat so you it's like you go against their own actions it's mm. like you are judging them so it's not very mm -hmm. well received and that's mm. why i spent a lot of time being vegan but not telling anybody about them uh, about it and this is one of the problems i guess with the current like mainstream vegan discourse mm. is that um when you did decide to start getting into activism or maybe what kind of encouraged you into activism was like the videos of like Joey Carbstrong and Earthling Ed, who are doing like the ultimate in white veganism. Yeah. Really. When you think like vegan cap, like if there's such a thing, which there isn't anyway, vegan capitalism, plant-based capitalism, yeah. basically. And then you started off by just trying to emulate that. And I, I suppose a lot of people around the world have tried that because we're told by them the only way is to tell people about the animals and show them graphic footage and 
tell them that K KFC has an option or whatever, you know? Well, it, it's quite different here because we do not have that many vegan options, maybe in Buenos Aires, but not here, not mm -hmm. in a small city. So we do not have that, uh, but we do reproduce this um, dynamic of guilting people into veganism, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, well, yeah, it's like the, num the number one influencer tactic. Yeah. <laughs> you do not try yeah. to listen to them and do not try to... Just tell them. Don't even listen to them. Just tell them <laughs> what you want. That's the latest like thinking yeah. don't even don't even try and understand them just fucking tell them it's ridiculous and also for producing this this offensive and oppressive language and this toxic rhetoric mm. yeah it, it it's all very very toxic but the thing is is mm -hmm. for i don't know the, the for the first couple of months or first year or even more the things you see are just av outreach videos and that's what you reproduce because that those are videos that are made for vegan mm. and mm -hmm. with all this rage and 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 fury that you feel those videos mm. fit perfectly and it's it's like a never ending cycle of I'm, I'm watching that. And that makes so much sense because factually you could say that's correct. Mm -hmm. and then they are never going to change that approach because people comment saying you are amazing. And that, that was great. Cannot believe how they cannot hear you. And it's mm -hmm. a, it's a cycle that cannot stop if we do not start shifting towards something different and towards something a bit mm. more complex and not so single issue. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so what do you think then of the links that we can make between feminism and anti-speciesism? Because we often see talking about the big influence and and so on, there's there's often that uh, meme. You know, you can't be a feminist if you're not vegan or whatever. Um, and, and there's a lot of that kind of using feminist, I suppose, issues around what it means to be female, into and just applying it to other species. Um, so, is there anything you have to? comment on that <laughs> well a lot <laughs> um first of all i think it just doesn't do to dismiss and compare different forms of oppression so comparing mm. um how women or females or non cis hetero white male are oppressed with the way Mm. animals are oppressed uh, i i just don't think the comparison does anybody any good i think what we need to do is acknowledge that all oppression responds to the same pattern of uh, a binarism and there's one part that is that is okay and the other part is there to be used and exploited and objectified and commodified and that's mm. the pattern for oppression in, in general i believe but that doesn't mean we can compare them mm. because then we take away the the particularities of each each person be them a mm. human animal or non-human animal right mm -hmm. um so so I think in general, anybody that doesn't conform to the hegemony is in a in a lower place in this hierarchical structure. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to to hide the capacity or, or to ignore the capacity a body has to suffer or feel 
And that's the entrance door to viewing them as useful to someone else's needs. So there are bodies that matter and bodies that do not. Mm. One of the, the pillars, I guess, of patriarchy is reproductive capacity. So mm. having a uterus or the ability or capacity to gestate is on itself a motive for oppression. There is a, there's a great book that kind of, that, that does an, an, an analysis on how not only human reproduction or human breeding creates and sustains life in the biological sense, but it also creates and sustains work capacity for the system, right? Mm -hmm. And you can, you can see a parallel there with other animals when they cannot reproduce anymore, they are discarded or sent to slaughter. Mm -hmm. So cows and hens are exploited for milk and eggs. And when they do not give enough to, to, to make it economically useful, they are killed, right? So mm. I guess if you think about the, if, if you think it or approach it from a feminist or from feminism, you could see that cows and hens because of their reproductive capacities have another or, or an additional mm. dimension to their use and exploitation mm. and something similar happens to us women when we cannot or do not want to have children we lose value to society but again it's not a comparison it's just mm -hmm. drawing parallels and finding ways that we cannot we, we can find similarities it's not comparing just drawing similarities mm. uh, the system creates bodies to oppress mm. and that's the same that happens with any body that doesn't conform to the hegemony of being human being white being male cis hetero yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you're, I guess, under capitalism, your body needs to be useful. Definitely, yes. <laughs> so, um, and what capitalism is really going to benefit from is more, even more bodies to sell stuff to um and to do work like wage labor um and i think also something that might come into that which i've read before is that um women do a lot of unpaid labor which helps prop up capitalism through motherhood yeah that, that's definitely part of it because um there's this whole construct that it's in in women's nature to reproduce and care and do this whole housework and all of that and those are tasks that are not considered work so they are unwaged mm -hmm. but they are the base for capitalism mm -hmm. without those tasks or, or yeah you, you cannot maintain mm. patriarchy nor capitalism you you need that mm. profit from free work and that that's the same that happens with mm. other animals we profit off their bodies and they have it, it's not mm -hmm. It's not a job. You do not do something in exchange from something else. It's just using a body because they have some use to you. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
Still, I do, I do not think it's the right approach saying that feminists should be vegans. I mean, nobody has to be or do anything. What we should do mm -hmm. is take steps toward questioning our privilege. So saying, if you're a feminist, you have to be vegan. I don't think that helps at all. We should promote mm -hmm. uh, this questioning of our own privileges. We, we cannot force people, we cannot force marginalized people mm. to also think about all of these other dimensions. We need to, to create bridges between movements to try and, mm -hmm. and view it all as a whole system of oppression. But we, we cannot pretend mm. to diminish a person's subjective experience by saying, hey, you have these mm -hmm. other animals that are suffering more than you. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah, that's quite a common one. It seems to have become the main sort of theme of veganism is that animals suffer the most Therefore, they should be the first, the kind of the first um, people that we should try to liberate. Yeah. It's pointless to approach it that way because you're only to, you're going to force people even further away. Mm -hmm. We need to, to consider liberation as a whole mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. For that, we cannot say, hey, because factually, we could say that animals are the most exploited beings, right? Because in, in numbers, you could mm -hmm. say that, I guess. But factually, it doesn't mean that's, that's the right way to approach it. Because that's, yeah, that takes away others' mm -hmm. suffering and others' oppression. And we cannot do that. We need to acknowledge how each person has their own subjective experiences. Mm -hmm. And those aren't less important because somebody else suffers more factually. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that's the, the kind of the illogical approach of the hierarchy of oppression, isn't it? That you have to wipe out the most oppressive thing at the bottom and then you can move up a step to the next oppressive thing. And I mean, we should know by now that, that life isn't that simple. It's like a complex, it's more like a web. It's not a triangle. And there's all these different like uh, points um, of like where oppression and privilege interact. And it's kind of subjective to, Although there's common themes for those different types of oppression, like you say, it's subjective to each person how they're going to um, experience that. And I, I think in a way, veganism or anti-speciesism is built on this kind of revolutionary base. Hmm. And if we live in an unjust system, the most revolutionary act we can perform is refusing to participate in any form of oppression of other bodies and other beings. And that includes all animals, human and non-human. Mm -hmm. So we, we cannot pretend to separate I think we can choose, choose to put more effort in one fight, if you might. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean hiding other dimensions to oppression. Mm. And it certainly doesn't give you like a, 
free pass to be oppressive in other ways yeah whilst you combat this supposed worst oppression no i I think veganism should be the entrance door to questioning our privilege Mm -hmm. so we cannot stand still we cannot say okay so i'm vegan now everything is okay because i'm not oppressing the most oppressed beings in the world that's not enough Hmm. we need to keep on questioning each Hmm. other and questioning ourselves because there's always something to learn and somebody to listen to I, i think the thing is there's this disconnection from activists from the theoretical approaches to each social movement so Hmm. we are not thinking about how our discourse in order to defend animals ends up repeating oppressive and discriminatory views and language Hmm. right we we are totally separated from the ideology behind veganism Hmm. so we we keep on repeating this um, processed speech Mm -hmm. that uh, white cis, I would assume, males are repeating in their videos. And we are not thinking about how more than 70% of this movement are female or non-cisgendered males. So why are we repeating oppressive discourses that mainstream vegans that are male and that they are the, the voice of veganism? How, how could that be? Mm. That, that's just not possible. It's like an elite boys club when you watch some of the stuff they get up to. Um, and yeah. and we, we are still keeping them in that... <laughs> Um, that pedestal, right? Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because you see one of these guys and all the followers they have and all the views they have, and they are so sure of all they keep on repeating, and you think that must be true. So I need to repeat this. That's that's absolutely mm. true because, mm-hmm. and. You know, it's just, you you really need to think about the language you use and the rhetoric you are repeating. Mm. We we cannot keep on um, just doing activism, whatever means necessary, you know? Mm. Mm -hmm. I think that's the thing. I think we really need to start breaking some new grounds now in how we educate the public not just in the formats like obviously like like taking a more institutional approach but like how how we talk about animal liberation and animal rights and um like the philosophy of veganism uh because it seems to have got so sidetracked it seems to me like it's if you were going to present like a case study on on the system, whichever system it is, capitalism, or perhaps even the meat industry, definitely capitalism, I guess, ultimately, on how to co-opt a, a social justice movement, like you would just pick veganism and go, wow, there's so much here Yes, <laughs> we could look at, like, uh, this is going to be a whole like university like <laughs> degree and how fucking how how not to do it like because they've it's and i guess it's because it it comes down so much to what we eat like people have to eat several times a day and you know food is something that's just ever present in our lives so it was kind of like an easy one it's like it's uh you know it's it's not it is a luxury but it's also a necessity so food is an easy one to kind of um if you can get control of that you know then you're 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 in control really yeah and and also i think that that's a good point because in mainstream 
activism or outrage. We are thinking of food as a commodity and not a right. Mm. So we are just, we are taking it, it as a given fact and mm. it's just not. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I also think we are focusing too, I don't know if too much, but almost solely on food. We are not considering other, other ways that speciesism manifests. Mm. Um, for example, here in Argentina, I mean, it's not very common, but you do see child labor with animal drawn carts. Okay. Mm. So there you have speciesism and social injustice because mm -hmm. the second way of child labor is with animal drawn carts. Mm -hmm. And we are not addressing that or we are addressing it uh, just with this speciesist dimension, but not thinking about why that kid is having to work. Yeah. And how can we separate those, those things? Mm. You, you are saving a horse, for example, but what's going to happen with that kid? Mm. And I do not have the answer to that. I'm still trying to, to find a way to, mm -hmm. to, to really make a connection that can fix everything. And I know that's, mm -hmm. that's not feasible, mm. but we should start thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Animal use doesn't just affect animals. It affects human animals too. Mm. And again, if we think about child labor, agriculture is the first cause of the first way that kids are made to work. Mm. So we, we cannot really separate human injustice from other animals' injustices. Now, I think that's might be quite particular to Latin America and or, or third world countries. But that's the thing. We are seeing these mainstream vegan activists repeating a discourse that goes against our reality. Mm -hmm. And that's negating mm -hmm. the, the social dimension that we so clearly can see here. Mm -hmm. That's why I, I think we should really start start focusing on regional and local activism that adjusts to the way each society works. Mm -hmm.